Greetings and welcome to In-Depth MDK Rasta. Global challenges, they require unified global responses. And to speak to one of those responses from the Global Psychology Alliance, which is an alliance that uses psychological science to elevate the field and enhance human well-being around the world, we have the Senior Director of the Office of International Affairs at the American Psychological Association, Dr. Amanda Clinton. Dr. Clinton, thank you so much for joining us. And we're talking about mental health in addition to whatever else. During the carnival season, when people say they take time for their mentals. But let's start off uh, give, getting an idea of what the Global Alliance is about and the importance of evidence-based action towards what you implement. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, at first time in Trinidad and first carnival. So... The Global Psychology Alliance was, was first convened in 2019 when about 50 leaders of psychology from around the world, every country that was willing to participate was invited. It's based on equity and inclusivity, met um, to talk about challenges that are too big for any one association. Doesn't matter how much money or how many members, how old that association is, but too big for us to face without coming together. And we have worked together. Now we're about 70 psychological associations over the past um, four years on issues like climate change and global mental health, particularly COVID and, and equity in, um, in mental health. Evidence, of course, is critical that we strongly believe that we need to be sure that what we share with our communities when we're working toward increasing and improving well-being and solid, good mental health, that we are using the science to the best of our knowledge, adapting that so it fits culturally, but making sure that we're not guessing, right? Psychology is a science and we want to be sure <clears throat> that we attend to what we know. And how important are people to that equation? And I ask because sometimes you build a, you have a structure and some people say if you build that structure, that system well enough, it doesn't matter who you plug in or plug out of the system. So what element does that people that people factor play in an alliance like this? It's It's everything. I mean, to be honest, the alliance has garnered the kind of strength and longevity it has to share science and applications of that science across the world because we are a team. We have trust levels that are very high. So if our representative from Trinidad, our representative from Nepal, our representative from Canada disagree on anything, then we work it out and we find a way forward that's, that's meaningful for all of us. And also, you know, the people that, that we wish to serve worldwide, we really start with people and positive ways of interacting. And from there, we can take the science, I think, to, to good, meaningful programs and implementation practices. And I appreciate the way you answer that because I think some every time you have a conversation, there are power dynamics that can raise their head. So if you have someone from a space that has a larger economy of scale or perceived power in that dialogue, sometimes it feels as though equity isn't quite there, but it seems as though that equity and equity framework is one that you have built into the alliance. And is... Is this something that needs to be checked on a daily basis? How are you aware that, okay, well, this is taking place as it should? Because we all have blind spots. So how do you how do you monitor that in the system as it progresses? Yeah, that's. I think that's an excellent question. I mean, bottom line is I work for the APA. I'm from the United States. I'm Caucasian, right? There's, um, and there are power dynamics that I, that I, I truly believe and hope that the understanding that we all share in the alliance is, hey, be honest. If I'm or any of us are putting, you know, uh, paying too much attention or not even aware, like you said, of the direction we're taking and the way we're kind of pushing an agenda versus coming along together, 
Um, I will say that there, there are brilliant checks and balances in the Alliance. So for example, I very often um, uh, turn over leader, gosh, even that word sounds <laughs> right. That's a power dynamic turn over the way the Alliance is set up. So careful on me is so that um, it, it, no single person has to be there to run a meeting that um, if it turns out I'm not, or any of my colleagues that I trust and we all do that since we're really working in horizontal leadership models we share that on our listserv and people step in very often a group of people will say oh sure we've got the reins on this one and um <clears throat> you know i i would say it's not perfect but we're certainly uh doing the very best we can to to bring truth to to what we believe in in terms of shared leadership as a model for global equity and diversity and the way it elevates human well-being. And you say that and that makes me think of Swarm, my theory a little more where everyone sees how they fit into the equation and okay, well, this amount of people can form a quorum that can go forward as opposed to saying, okay, well, we need to wait on that specific person. But I want you to dive a little bit into the psyche of behavioral change or exchange seeing that we don't necessarily just drop one thing as opposed to fill that void with another. And this is as it, this is as you try to tick boxes that go into addressing some of the cognitive dissonance that would engage the science towards practical policies. Mm -hmm. So where is it, what we're doing and what we're, um, saying don't exactly gel is that the question i'm answering so so look so looking at that science and saying okay well what are some of these things that we need to do especially if we want to kind of move people away from some of the cognitive dissonances they may have so to to, gotcha. to to achieve some uh outcome that we want that's a tough question <laughs> i would say it's interesting um i think human motivation is uh is extremely complicated. How do we move people out? We were, you know, I was speaking about this earlier today with colleagues from Trinidad, and we were thinking about how do you, how do you motivate people to change their behavior when human beings are inclined toward comfort, right? And it is very easy to say, well, hey, I'll just pick climate. I recycle, so I can still drive my car. I'm actually doing something for the, um, I would say that what we know uh, based on science and the way people change is that small steps are most effective, that where we can engage our communities and it becomes more of a social norm, we tend to have greater impact, certainly where our policymakers are involved. And my understanding is actually that um, leadership in Trinidad just uh, made some big decisions on green energy in the country. So depending on where all those pieces come together, what small steps an individual can take, how we can bring in our communities. And then of course, that's grassroots kind of bottom up. If our policymakers are also involved, that's, um, that's very strong, but mostly human beings want to know what's in it for me. I want to wear my seatbelt, not because somebody tells me to, but because I want my family to be safe. And so a lot of it has to do with changing our messaging so that human beings can reconcile that cognitive dissonance. And with that, we take a short break. I like that point you were making, whether or not grassroots or the macro level. And I think we want to come back there. Uh, speaking with psychologist, Dr. Amanda Clinton. Stay with us, we'll return with more. Welcome back. We are speaking with psychologist Dr. Amanda Clinton, the Senior Director for the Office of International Affairs at the American Psychological Association. Now, some persons look at the macro level only and say, okay, well, it needs to be a top down. You spoke about uh, someone mandating, okay, well, you need to wear a seatbelt because we make it low, versus building it up and having that buy in. Uh, is there a magical formula? Do we look at different areas and say, okay, well, 
because we're in this area, we need to approach it from this level. How do we combine that approach, top down as well as grassroots going up? You ask exceptional questions, <laughs> I, truly. Um, that's something that I think that uh, all of us in the Global Psychology Alliance have been struggling with. I guess I would say um, in terms of leading for change, uh, being active in both spaces, which is we, the Alliance has worked very hard to um, get space in climate summits. For example, we had space to talk about psychological science and climate in Glasgow last year uh, and, and just this past November in um, Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. And it was really a function of using our network because many of the psychologists in the Alliance are very well connected in their communities. And then they can talk to United Nations experts or nonprofit experts, et cetera. And when we connect there across the world, we try to frame that and send it to high level leadership in each of our countries, as well as to United Nations or the World Health Organization. And when they see, well, there's at least 70 countries, leaders of psychology coming together, they listen more. But I think that, you know, policy and change is is slow. I think of it as the as the Grand Canyon, the Colorado River it might take millions of years, it, but eventually, you know, the water finds its ocean. And so that we all need to just do our best to move that direction and um, stay focused on our goal. But while eventually the water may find its direction and stuff, it seems as though certain ways we're running out of time. And with that first part of a two-part question, how important is it that you have individuals who are dealing with mental processes, the way that we think about things, uh, kind of helping to bridge that gap a little bit between information about climate change and action to help mitigate some of the things that we're doing. And I asked the question because I remember having a communications post working with a lot of scientists and trying to get what it is they were saying to individuals, laypersons, because sometimes it can feel like Greek, where you have people not or, or another language, but trying to get people to speak the same language, but even think along the same wavelength. How important is it that you are in the, or the alliance is in this position at this point in time? I think it's critically important that optimally, you know, psychological science says a lot about effective communication, just like you said. So first of all, the more personalized it is, the more effective it'll be. If I bring a met I'm from Alaska. If I bring a message from Alaska to Trinidad, it doesn't make too much sense. But if um, if our communities here or in Alaska are speaking to each other and developing those messages, then it makes sense. So psychological science is about how to frame things, not how people need to do it. If that makes sense, why what, what I can share as a scientist is we know it should be personalized, which means. And for the alliance, that means our leadership in Trinidad or our leadership in any of the other alliance countries, they develop their message. We're all just sharing science, so we know how to best use it. Individualized, um, very proactive. A lot of climate messaging is about the end of the world, which tends to make people scared and they get immobilized. So if you say, try this, then, then they tend to be responsive and take small steps. If you... Um, also provide psychoeducation along this path. I've learned so much that I thought I knew, right? Recycling is effective. Turns out it's not as effective as I thought. Um, composting is easy. It is eventually, you know, uh, that battery powered cars are the solution. They are part of a solution. Uh, and so I, I think being sure we share information, but like you said, um, just in, in, in ways we can use it within our context and daily lives. I don't understand when I go to an engineering conference on, you know, um, lithium <laughs> makes no sense to me, but what psychology can do is translate that into, Hey, here's what we need to know to change our behavior. And second part in terms of how important uh, mental health practitioners are at this time, uh, what's the significance or the importance of anyone 
highlighting the importance of well-being, including mental health at this time, looking at the changes that we've had, the way that we interact with each other uh, because of the pandemic. There are people who are so stimulated by touch, not able to engage with individuals the same way. So mental health treating with this and just bringing it to the fore because there's so many stigmas that we're still dealing with even before the pandemic. Where do you see mental health practitioners at this point in time advocating for wellness? I'm glad you asked, DK. I So I agree with you completely. We're, we're actually seeing a consistent increase worldwide in um, like youth suicide attempts in depression rates and uh, mental health practitioners are extremely important in both a population health, a prevention approach that is, you know, reminding ourselves as well as the rest of the community and um, wherever our health ministries and um, education teams can, can incorporate uh, points like normalizing the fact that high stress tends to create a certain response in human beings that it's okay to feel anxious when the world feels so uncertain. And certainly I've met uh, many extremely talented psychologists in Trinidad and from Trinidad. And I think their contributions, both at this prevention level, but also in the clinical service level, providing um, good intervention and care when someone is reaching a crisis stage. In fact, I believe there is a, um, there's a helpline that was developed during COVID in Trinidad that is still open. And so that the action that your mental health professionals have taken is, is really exceptional. But, you know, if we look, just look at how human beings function, the reality is um, we all go through highs and lows. At any point in time, about 25% of the world's population is experiencing some form of normative extreme stress, which translates to things like depression or anxiety. And then, and so most everyone in their lives will experience, um, you know, mental health challenges. It's, it's part of life and we can help each other better if we're honest and open about that. And we have two minutes more, Dr. Clinton. You said that you like to help develop effective and meaningful approaches to living fulfilling lives. How do you do that when you have individuals saying, okay, well, the life that people say is fulfilling, I don't find it as fulfilling. And possibly are trying to pull away from those things. Uh, and this is even before we talk about passive or, or active suicidal ideation. What are some mm -hmm. of those things that you 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 utilize? Yeah, I so I that's another excellent question. I mean, I think if somebody is really struggling at the point that you mentioned and you know, kind of what the environment offers isn't providing them the the space they need to thrive, then um, paying careful attention to the way in which we might be able to make small changes in the environment, whether it's oneself and their habits um, or their immediate context. Also, very often we find that working on changing our thought patterns is act quite effective, even although this this sounds now it's going to make me smile silly. <laughs> if when people smile, like force themselves to smile, it tends to increase the feel good neurotransmitters in our brains. So um, clinicians have lots of tools that can be a great help to someone with relative ease and effectiveness. It just depends on them reaching out. And to your point, I, you know, it's a tricky space. Human beings are we're kind of pack animals, right? We really want to socialize, but also understanding that I don't have to, I, I, I can be polka dots while the person next to me is stripes and we're still, you know, we're on the same team that you don't have to follow the paces of everybody around you to be a complete person. So I want to thank you so much for that. And throughout the entire conversation, one of the things that I've taken away from you is tiny incremental steps leading to where we want to be. Dr. Amanda Clinton, we want to thank you so much. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been In Depth with me, DK Roster. Thank you so much for joining us.